Um, welcome. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight for this evening's um, events, which promise to be a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I'm Carrie Johnson. I'm the professor and chair in the Department of Communication here at UCLA. As we begin tonight, tonight's events, I'd like to thank Nancy and Barry Sanders and their family for uh, making this evening possible. Thank you for your vision and your support um, and your involvement in tonight's program. More broadly, it's a pleasure to look out and see so many new faces and some familiar faces. Um, we have many of our own faculty members in the audience tonight, as well as faculty and administrators from across campus. We're also joined by many of our friends and alumni to the program, many of whom have partnered with our department um, to help us thrive, and I look forward to continuing those partnerships together. I'd like to briefly contextualize tonight's events um, and give it a little bit of focus before we begin. Scholarship and communication seeks to illuminate how information is sent and received, sometimes between individuals, through groups, and through mediated forms. Our faculty members conduct groundbreaking research in these areas. For example, we now know how a baby's babbling elicits a response from a caregiver, how people coordinate their actions and utterances during social interactions, and how new and emerging technologies um, can either promote or preclude meaningful social exchange. We even know how and why politicians shift their messaging to either be more centrist or more extreme as a function of the political institutions in which they find themselves. These are among the department's recent discoveries, which are key to the discipline of communication. Tonight, however, we will be focused on nonverbal communication, a mode of communication that per pervades our daily lives. Whether it's a glance across a room, the tone in somebody's laughter, or a glimpse of somebody's body in motion, nonverbal communication is central and powerful. So powerful, in fact, that it is part and parcel to an artist's communication with his or her audience and between audience members themselves. Tonight's lecture celebrates these profound ways that the arts communicate with us, moving us, inspiring us, and yes, at times challenging us. Fundamentally, the arts embed us, the perceivers, within a physical and social context that shifts our perceptions. With this framework in mind, I cannot imagine a more appropriate guest for tonight's lecture. Described by the New York Times as opera's disruptor in residence, Yuval Sharon has been creating an unconventional body of work that harnesses the power of context to shift an audience perception. He founded and serves as the artistic director of the industry in Los Angeles, an acclaimed company devoted to new and experimental opera that has brought opera into moving vehicles, train stations, and other unconventional spaces such as warehouses, parking lots, and escalator corridors. I might ask him to translate it to classroom experiences, we'll see. <laughs> Cross your fingers for me. Sharon conceived of and directed and produced the company's acclaimed world premieres of Hopscotch, Invisible Cities, and Crescent City. He also devised and directed the company's two performance installations, NC at the Hammer Museum and Nimbus at the Walt Disney Concert Hall. He staged productions in more convention, his staged productions in more conventional spaces have been described as ingenious, uh, virtuosic, dizzyingly spectacular, and staggering. He's the recipient of the 2014 Goetz Friedrich Prize in Germany for his production of John Adams' uh, Dr. Atomic. The list, quite frankly, goes on and on, um, featuring all of the wonderful works and influential pieces that bring his unique approach to audiences across the world. Fortunately for us, Sharon is currently in a residency at the LA Philharmonic, where his projects include commissioned works, site-specific installations, performances outside the hall, such as um, an original setting of War of the Worlds performed both inside and outside the concert hall simultaneously, and unique stagings of Mahler with Gustavo Dudamel with the LA Phil. These, among many others here and abroad, are why we are so privileged to welcome here tonight. Throughout his work, Sharon uses context, voice, and propinquity to challenge his audience, often embedding them within the experience that aims to juxtapose performance with reality. By relocating opera outside of the traditional theater, Sharon's work invites observers to reconstruct the world around them 
And in doing so, he's also challenged us to reconstruct opera itself. It's unsurprising, therefore, that Sharon has been honored with the 2017 MacArthur Fellowship, commonly referred to as the Genius Grant, and a Foundation for Contemporary Art Grant for Theater. He serves on the board of Opera America, the Artist Council for the Hammer Museum, and is a fellow at the LA Institute for Human Humanities. Enough of me. Let's hear from our uh, guest this evening. Would you please help me warmly welcome Yuval Sharon? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was beautiful. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. That was such a beautiful introduction. Um, I hope to live up to all of that, uh, <laughs> all of that stuff. Um, I, I think a lot of people here, as I look around, I see a lot of familiar faces. For those of you that, that have heard me speak before, uh, I'm probably going to stick a little bit more to script than you might be used to because I was asked by Barry to deliver a paper, a little bit more formal of a paper. So um, if this is odd, um, it's odd for me too. So uh, <laughs> we're all in the same boat here. Um, uh, afterwards, we'll have a great opportunity to do a Q&A where it could be a little bit uh, less formal. Um, but I do want to talk, I do want to start by talking about um, the most recent production that I did. Um, I had the great honor this summer to direct Wagner's Lohengrin at the legendary Bayreuth Festival. And it was an experience that was so big on so many levels that I haven't yet quite processed it to the level where I can do my elevator pitch kind of brief response when someone says, well, how was Bayreuth? You know, um, I always feel like I have to do my quick uh, response, like, I was great, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, but of course, it was a deep and rich and meaningful experience. Um, and it's clarified a lot of the thoughts that I've been developing about opera um, ever, ever since I've started directing opera and how it relates to the concept of nonverbal communication. But this is somewhat difficult for opera because opera has a fundamental uh, verbal component, which is the words and what gets sung by the various people that are dressed in costume and trying to convey a story. Um, so that re relationship of text and non-text is uh, a rich subject, but that I think is for a different lecture. Um, instead, today, from the point of view of a stage director, I want to talk about the nonverbal ways that opera reaches the spectator um, it's something that I contemplate a lot in terms of the visual and in terms of um, that, that non-literal aspect of it. So for tonight's lecture, um, and in relation to the experience at Bayreuth, I'm going to concentrate on the silent figure that appeared at the very end of uh, Lohengrin. Uh, this is the silent figure of Gottfried, uh, or as some people have somewhat pejoratively called him, uh, the green man, uh, <laughs> right there in the center. So for those of you that didn't see it, um, let me give you a little bit of context as to why this seemingly innocuous figure um, seems to have been the most controversial aspect of the production. The opera tells the story of Elsa, who is wrongly accused of murdering her brother and who is saved by the miraculous appearance of a knight in shining armor in a boat pulled by a swan. Sounds very rational, doesn't it? Um, so he rescues her and agrees to marry her with one quite severe condition. She must never ask the name or origin of this man. So talk about nonverbal communication. I think that's pretty, pretty significant, uh, non-communication at least. But this commandment goes even further than that. It's even more severe than that. She must never even experience the anxiety of knowing, which means that Lohengrin doesn't just control her actions, but also controls her thoughts. Uh, so um, in, El for, in the story, what happens is that Elsa breaks that commandment in Act 3. The man is revealed to have the name Lohengrin, and he's a knight of the grail, and now that he's found out, he needs to return to his mystical brotherhood. So traditionally read, the opera is about the tragic failure of a woman's faith in uh, and everything that she and the society loses for not simply obeying the demands of this angel-like figure. So not only do I not think that is a story worth telling nowadays, I don't even believe that's what Wagner was saying. I actually believe, when you think about the context that he wrote this piece, uh, he wrote it um, at the time when he was getting ready for the barricades in Dresden. It, he wrote it in this revolutionary time. And the idea that he would create a piece that praised blind faith seemed to me uh, to make no sense at all. And the more I thought about the piece, not just in relation to how it would read in 2018, the more I realize that it is uh, a quite subversive, uh, a quite subversive piece in many ways. Part of the subversiveness 
for us uh, entailed the fact that our production had a kind of fairy tale aesthetic. Uh, the uh, artists Neo Rauch and Rosa Loy were my chief collaborators on this project. And they had already gotten started by the time I had come on board. And they imagined this kind of fairy tale world, blue and white, Delft China, um, this, uh, this kind of, um, as you see in this picture, also a kind of two dimensionality, a painterly aspect. Um, by the way, for those of you that want to hear more about this aspect and about the collaboration uh, that we had, uh, I'm doing a talk with them, Neo and Rosa, at the Broad Museum on November 8th. But for tonight, let me suffice to say that their visual impulses really helped inspire my own ideas about how I wanted the story to be told. And I think that the contrast between the fairy tale aesthetic and this more um, socially progressive uh, political message um, kind of fit nicely uh, together when I think about the music that Wagner wrote for this. Because the music is some of Wagner's most beautiful music, but it's also his most old-fashioned. There are um, ensembles, there are duets, um, there, there's a lot of chorus. That's a lot of stuff that, um, that, that he, you might think when you hear Wagner, you think of something totally different. But this was kind of his farewell, in a way, to romantic opera, which is why he gave it the name Romantic Opera. It's the last piece that he wrote with the title romantic, with, with the title opera at all. Every piece after that became uh, uh, music drama or a festival or something like that. Um, so the more that you hear the piece, the longer the piece goes on, it is struggling against this corset of a traditional uh, language, musical language. And by Act Three, when Elsa breaks free of the commandment from Lohengrin, uh, you start to hear that advanced modern sound that we really associate with Wagner and the Ring and Parsifal. Um, so, with that in mind, um, the two dimensionality and the um, and that sense of the fairy tale, I thought, reflected that old fashioned quality in a very powerful way. Um, the way that we developed Elsa's. Oh, there we go. Um, Elsa's awakening was for a gradual uh, introduction of orange as a contrary color to blue. This was, again, uh, an initial idea by Neo and Rosa. And I loved their way of thinking about this because it was um, so elemental. It was just on the level of color. And then it became kind of up to me to figure out how that connected to the story. This is a, uh, a picture from Act Three when they're finally alone together for the very first time, and Lohengrin kind of reveals exactly who he is. The orange really starts to dominate more and more. And by the end, in the last scene, uh, Elsa uh, is dressed all in orange while the rest of her society that she's left behind remains in blue. So it became this kind of symbolic Show, a symbolic way to show her own emancipation. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, there's a final twist, though, as I <laughs> just mentioned. Uh, so Gottfried, right at the very end, in a silent appearance. Now, this is the brother we hear about at the very beginning, and three hours later, he suddenly appears, right when we think the opera is over. Um, this is traditionally it kind of proves that Lohengrin has a kind of positive magic as opposed to the black magic of the uh, villain characters. Um, but what's strange about this appearance is just how drastic and how sudden it is. So we decided to portray Gottfried as this kind of green character, as this figure that you saw earlier that was kind of like a walking tree. It's an image that first appeared in Neo's dreams. And that intuitive response to this final miracle had a surprising resonance for, for me and for everyone else that worked on the project. But we couldn't articulate what that was. Uh, it was just that shock of the green after so much blue and orange that felt like it resonated uh, with what the opera was about. And that quality of green, of course, carries with it a lot of connotations, hope, nature, many, many other things. Everyone gets a chance to come up with their own idea. So I was actually quite surprised. Uh, like I said, a relatively innocuous idea, I thought, turned out to be um, kind of controversial. Uh, on, uh, the, during the dress rehearsal, which some of my friends here attended, um, they can attest that there was some audible laughter when uh, Gottfried <laughs> emerged. And opening night, there wasn't laughter, but there was certainly, I could hear all the eyebrows raising, basically, in the, uh, in the auditorium. Um, the acoustics in Bayreuth are su uh, superb. Um, so um, it just se seemed to me all of a sudden that there was an audience that didn't know how to place this sudden introduction of something that had nothing to do with anything that had followed previously. So this led me to start thinking, why are so many people asking me, what does it mean? That was the constant question. What does, it, what does he mean? Why is he green? Um, so on. I can't say I was surprised, but I was a bit taken aback that uh, so few people took a moment to sort of process 
what that could mean for them as an audience member before assuming that I had somehow failed to do my job to supply the meaning for this figure. Because my intention was exactly the opposite, was to not supply the meaning for it, to give that power to the audience. And that's what I want to talk about uh, today. Um, the two big challenges that I see uh, in creating opera, um, one of them is meaning, and one of them might be slightly more metaphysical, which is the challenge in opera on the topic of, uh, of the nonverbal of making something that's immaterial material. Um, this is a picture of uh, Robert Barry's piece, Inert Gas Series, from 1969. And this is a piece that consists entirely of him releasing noble gases into the air at given times. And it was a piece that was designed to be everywhere and nowhere. It basically just existed in the audience's imagination. The same year, he did another piece uh, called Telepathic Piece, which really only consisted of the description, uh, which was that during the exhibition, I will try to communicate telepathically a work of art, the nature of which is a series of thoughts that are not applicable to language or image. So why do I bring this up? Uh, maybe there's some, maybe there, the connection seems uh, obvious to some people. But for me, I think what, what Barry's doing and a lot of artists that dealt with conceptual art um, was thinking about how uh, to actually materialize an idea. And I think that gets to the root of what art is all about. Something that exists in the ideal sphere, finding its place in the real world. That is a process that involves a certain amount of loss, in a way. Because uh, in our ideas, anything is possible. And in reality, we have things like gravity. We have things like physics. Um, we have a number of things that do require us to have this relationship between the, uh, the material and the immaterial. Um, so I see here a striving on the part of contemporary artists from, from the 60s onward uh, of art moving towards the condition of music. Because music, I think, is the closest to the ideal that we can possibly imagine. I think like Barry's inert gas piece, music really only exists as a vibration in air, which only lasts as much time as the vibration is carried. It doesn't take any vis visible form. It stakes a claim in time, but not in space. And yet, the realization of that ideal is purely through material means, through the wood of a violin, the breath of a performer, the, the metal that produces that exact bell sound that the composer has in their mind. So before a piece can be performed, it has to be notated, much to the chagrin of many composers who are often working under an intense deadline to try and figure out how to take this, what's in here, and put it on paper so that uh, the, the people that are going to realize those ideas could actually have something to rehearse and actually bring to life. Uh, in that process of notation, the first steps are made towards bringing those thoughts that are not applicable to language or image, as Barry put, uh, into something that performers can reproduce. Um, I think this was maybe most beautifully um, captured um, by Daniel Barenboim talking about um, Arnold Schoenberg's music. He said that like all works of music, Schoenberg's pieces were initially present only in the imagination, in the mind of the composer. It had nothing to do with anyone else or indeed with the real world. When the composer has written it down, it is already a reduction. And before one can talk about a performance at all, one has to consider the orchestra and the conductor who introduced these pieces into our physical world. I can think of a sound in my mind, and it can last forever. But when I play the same sound on the piano, it dies away. For this reason, transferring it from the cosmos, where it only exists in the imagination of the mind of the composer, to the real world is a decisive and complicated process. And I think that gets to the heart of what makes opera actually quite an absurd art form in many ways. Because we have this invisible ideal world, this world of music. Uh, you know, orchestras have it a lot easier because yes, it, there, there's the violins, there's, the, there's the, the, the winds, there's all the sections, there's the individual instruments. But somehow opera is given this additional task of, of cloaking this invisibility somehow, and making it manifest in space. And that is something that's really challenging. Um, you know, after all, there will be singers and presumably sets and costumes uh, that you have to kind of come up with. And the director with a team comes up with how exactly do we visualize and make material something that actually is aspiring so strongly to the condition of the immaterial. 
Does it potentially rob music of its power for it to be basically the handmaid of drama? That's been a constant, I think, concern for a lot of composers who, who might dislike opera or have uh, decided not to do an opera. But even more challenging are the pieces that still treat music as a path towards the ineffable which then somehow needs to be made physical in a production. I'm thinking of an opera like, like Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, which in many ways is the kind of the ultimate opera about the unresolvable tension between what is visible and what has to remain invisible. It is a piece about forms dissolving into each other over and over again for hours. And what happens when it gets staged over and over again? It wants to be like this somehow. Every time I've seen this painting, I've always thought about uh, Tristan and Isolde. And uh, painters have that opportunity to create this ideal space, um, even in material terms. But instead, we end up getting uh, the kind of, I didn't see this production. I'm, I'm not, I was a little afraid uh, <laughs> that, that it'll seem like I'm critiquing this production. I didn't see it, but what I, what I love about this image is this is kind of the process. There's a space that needs to be filled. And often it is incredibly material and heavy. Uh, and this music that feels really like it flows uh, is, is like the, the essence of water suddenly becomes incredibly brittle and hard. And um, it's as if the music, as if you're watching the music calcify before your eyes and you notice the singers Trying to catch their, uh, trying to catch the conductor uh, in whatever monitor they can see. You're seeing the sets come on in and out. Um, there's suddenly there's a there's an almost uh, absurdity about the material aspect of something that that strives so strongly uh, for losing its materiality. And this might be best represented by the opera uh, by Debussy, uh, the Pelleas and Melisande, that has a librettist a libretto by the symbolist poet Maeterlinck. It's full of symbols and images, and much of it rotates around the fact that the main character Melisande has beautiful hair, long and luxurious hair. And in one scene, Pelias, uh, her lover, uh, is entwined in it. And in the next uh, act, uh, her jealous husband is grabbing her by the hair and pushing her in the directions of the cross. So on paper and musically, and even when I describe the scenes, they have an in instant either romance or violence to them. But put yourself in the place of the poor stage director who has to somehow make that hair work um, and finding a visual realization that will somehow convey the, the truth behind that image, what's, what's beyond just that visual idea. Um, and again, I, I, I turn to a conductor for this, Pierre Boulez. He has a wonderful essay on this opera called Reflections on Pelias. Oh, sorry, this was, this was what Pelias feels to me <laughs> like. And uh, this is Pierre Boulez's uh, uh, quote about it, which I think is so beautiful. The poetic themes in Pelias often remain imaginary in character, and their representation on the stage is marked by a heavy realism that contradicts their dreamlike quality. Take the first scene of Act Three, where Melisande lets down her long hair. It proves in practice extremely hard to make the symbolism of hair as river, hair as erotic symbol, visually acceptable, even plausible. The poetic imaginary vision is difficult to combine with a girl leaning out a window and a hair that is quite obviously a wig. And that is so true. Um, it's like, okay, you know, from, from that black and white beautiful uh, Munch image to this is, you know, like, and this might have been a great performance, but you know, you see this and you, you, you see the, conf the confines of, of theater. So it sometimes can seem so foolish to continue inflecting works that seem to have no true inflection point or possibility even of an inflection point. And yet we can't help but doing so anyway. Uh, and maybe that's what I really love about opera because there's no such thing as the perfect production of an opera. Um, it's a quixotic struggle every single time to nevertheless make the immaterial material, and that's part of opera's aspirational quality. Because that contrast between the idea and the possibility of a realization are actually inexhaustible. I just made opera maybe sound a little tawdry and impoverished by saying that you can't, you know, it never quite reaches the, the, the goals of the piece. But actually, um, I think that that contrast is exactly what makes opera an inexhaustible and, in, and a never completed journey, both for the artists that do opera and hopefully also for the audiences. Uh, so I want to return to Wagner for a second because uh, this hit him particularly hard because he built this theater to house the first production of Wagner's of his of his Ring Cycle, um, uh, a 16-hour epic that needed to break all of the boundaries of traditional theater and certainly every boundary of traditional opera 
and uh, it required its own architecture. So um, uh, this is, I think that with those goals in mind, there's really no way that he could be anything other than crushingly disappointed by the first production, and indeed he was. He was very unhappy, um, starting right from the beginning, uh, very famously with the opening of Das Rheingold, you get this sense of movement and freedom and these um, silvery sirens that are singing under the water. They're like the embodiment of this flowing water. And instead, in reality, uh, what you got was a rather clunky contraption um, that actually completely leaned on old ideas of stagecraft, Baroque stagecraft. Um, and, uh, you know, th the idea suddenly was uh, that, 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 that movement that's in the music suddenly had a kind of static quality, even if those Rhine maidens were going back and forth <laughs> on those wagons. You know, there's only so far they could go, and it is like a 25-minute scene. So, um, you know, that's <laughs> the endless... You know, Wagner writes so much about endless melody, but that is just very hard to translate onto the stage. And now having gone to Bayreuth, I, um, I'm wondering if he did himself a bit of a disservice in some ways uh, by his insistence on this proscenium art. But I'll get to that in a second, because um, after, after the premiere of The Ring Cycle, he was so disappointed that he has this famous quote um, that goes, I made the invisible orchestra, now I need to make the invisible theater. And what, what he means by that, by the Invisible Orchestra in particular, uh, are these pictures that you see here of um, what he calls the kind of uh, mystical abyss, which is the orchestra pit, which in Bayreuth is covered, is covered by that, uh, by that black shell, which means when you sit in the auditorium, you uh, don't see the musicians at all. Uh, your focus is entirely on the action on stage and what is happening uh, on, on the stage, what, what, what is happening in the drama. That is your only focus. Um, you don't even get much light from the orchestra, so there is this darkness in the space. And the sound quality is miraculous. For those of you that have been to Bayreuth, it's as if the sound is emanating from every corner of the theater, from below you, from around you. And uh, it's, it's a magical effect by, by, by all means. But the longer that I was there, I wondered whether it was such a good idea. <laughs> because, um, there's something about the idea that the stage needs to carry everything um, instead of this more dialogic relationship between stage and music that might actually really have backfired, especially in the case of these really long uh, operas with long scenes. I think what Wagner was so intent on was that the world behind this proscenium arc felt like this dream world that you lost yourself into. But when you think back on that picture of the Rhine maidens on these wagons going back and forth, you know, that proscenium arc suddenly feels incredibly imprisoning for the real spirit of the music and the real spirit of what it is that, he's, uh, that he was trying to accomplish. And in this way, I have to say, I've been so, I've loved this, my opportunities to create stage productions at the LA Phil. Um, this is a picture from Young Caesar that I did um, last June, where the orchestra is always in plain sight because the activity and the visual effect of the orchestra offers a kind of relation to the image suggested by the stage. And I think that can be a real relief uh, to let your attention wander away from the stage. I know this sounds crazy from a stage director's point of view uh, advocating for this, but nonetheless, I loved, I loved the ability to let my mind and let my eye kind of wander and to see all of the effects of what a performance is in space, which includes very powerfully all of the people that are making music uh, um, uh, to support the dramatic and theatrical ideas. Uh, you know, after all, I've noticed how my own gaze and my attention wander a lot when I'm in the theater, and I'm always worried that if anyone's sitting behind me at the uh, LA Phil that they must think I'm bored out of my mind because I'm looking everywhere, I'm looking in the corners, I'm looking at the light grid, I'm thumbing through my program, but it doesn't mean that I'm not engaged. I'm actually still listening and uh, feeling and dreaming along with everything that's happening on the stage. It's just in a way that allows for all of the impressions of the space that I'm in to resonate, um, which I think um, is a powerful thing. And resonate, obviously, as a musical idea is such an important part. Um, uh, and this is also, I have to say, the challenge, I think maybe uh, any of you that have seen a video of a production uh, that maybe you've loved when you saw it in the theater and you see it on video and it just feels like an entirely different performance because the freedom that your eye had while you watch a live performance of kind of zooming into a certain detail, 
and like zooming back out and seeing it from a different vantage point, uh, seeing the entire stage all at once, uh, being distracted by something, but somehow that becoming part of the performance for you. Uh, all of that goes away, and when you see a video of a performance, you have the fixed frame of an individual piece. Um, and, you know, there's something about that that for me has always inspired me to want to do productions where that idea of a fixed single idea uh, was uh, erased. That the idea that the audience could move freely uh, from one idea to another as fluidly as thought and that we actually would never, we would never have only one stimulus, uh, visual stimulus or aural stimulus to concentrate on. Um, oh, I wanted to show you briefly this picture. I'll do this just very quickly. This is the, um, uh, this, this was my version now of Peleas and Melisande at the Cleveland Orchestra. And I kind of feel that, uh, you know, in terms of the visuals, um, you could change a million times. But the idea that you would see the orchestra during Peleas, in this case, the singers were on those boxes, and behind them was this um, glass box that filled up with fog and would, uh, the fog would sometimes overwhelm these actors that were depicting the story, so you'd only see uh, an opaque glass box, and sometimes the fog would dissipate and a story would emerge, or a piece of choreography, or just an object. And so that idea that our, our visuals, our, our visual connection to the piece came and went, and that we couldn't stay focused on any one thing, but were allowed to move freely uh, in terms of our ideas, um, was something that I think really captured uh, and in this case, too, you see the hair, uh, how I solved the hair, which was as a projection on that wall. Uh, <laughs> and I think, it, I think it worked pretty well. Um, but this leads me to um, that second, uh, to go back to, to what uh, I started this talk with, which is Gottfried and all of the people that said, well, what, what does this character mean? Why is he green? Um, and I have to say that it's funny for me, I mentioned Robert Berry and uh, some other artists, um, despite all of that, that experimentation over the last century, I think there still remains this dictatorship of meaning, that uh, performative pieces should have, should have a stable and decipherable, more or less, singular meaning uh, that the artist should be able to verbalize and that the meaning is totally understandable for the audience, that that communication from artist to uh, audience is, um, is simple <laughs> and is kind of a one-to-one -one thing. Uh, I'm, I don't want, that's obviously a, a massive uh, simplification, but since I don't have a ton of time left, I'm actually going to uh, simplify even further <laughs> and, and ask us to think about art, the two different modes of art, um, as if there were only two. But let's think about two. The first is a kind of a murder mystery. Okay, it's like a murder mystery in an Agatha Christie novel or Sherlock Holmes story. There might be a really strange supernatural occurrence that no one can explain. And then all of a sudden, uh, there's the answer. There's like the key that solves the whole problem. So there's a perfectly rational explanation for everything is the kind of response that underlies that particular expectation. The idea that everything has a meaning if we can only uncover it. So to put it in other words, the, this mode really affirms the world as we see it, uh, saying that this, uh, this world as we have it is correct, is proper, and that aberrations of reality or the things that we can't explain could be corrected with good old-fashioned detective work. Uh, and if I didn't uncover it in the course of the performance uh, as a spectator, either the art is bad or I have an inferior intellect, which is never something that we want people to leave the theater feeling. <laughs> Um, so, you know, and of course it's satisfying when you get to that moment in a performance that you have that aha moment where you say, okay, oh, now I get it, and it's all solved. That can be really great, but it's that satisfaction of a kind of confirmation of our reality. And it's not that different from suddenly remembering where you lost your keys. So it's not like there was a vortex opened up and swallowed your keys because the universe uh, is trying to exact re revenge on you in some way. But oh no, I left my keys in my pocket and that's why they're right here. Uh, so it's that same kind of confirmation of, of a reality that ends up feeling like, okay, the, the, the world as we know it can carry on at the end of this. The contrast to that and the con what I feel more inspired by if we have murder mystery on one side, we have kind of the dream on the other. And that's really the realm of poetry and the associative and the inexplicable and the irrational, the, the keys that never get found again, that did get swallowed by the vortex uh, somehow. Um, and I find the irrational so important because it reminds us of everything that we don't know and everything that we don't understand, that our, pers our perspective of the world um, you know, it obviously favors normalcy and favors everything being in its right place. 
Um, but that is, I think, art can tell us very strongly, is an illusion. Um, Oscar Wilde put it so beautifully, art is a lie that tells the truth. And I think there's an aspect of this that I think is what he means, that um, through illusory means, through artificial means, we're actually discovering how our own world, our own perception of the world, is built on uh, those illusions, is built on, uh, on, on artifices. And I think that might be why I actually, um, in a way that might seem contradictory, I might be then more in favor of the visible rather than the invisible orchestra because that illusory quality of the floating world can't fully trick us into believing that it's a world we can fall in like a virtual reality piece. And this is why I think these, um, this is a picture from David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. And I, you know, those are films that either you love or you hate. Um, it, it tells you a lot about whether you prefer the kind of murder mystery approach or <laughs> this kind of dream approach. Um, but I find them so essential, even if they're difficult for some people to sit through, because uh, they remind us of the inexplainable in our lives. And just the way that the absurd scenarios created by Samuel Beckett can tell us, I think, so much more about what it means to be human than a naturalistic play about a couple fighting uh, in the kitchen. Um, or Roberto Bolaño's epic novel, 2666, uh, in which five seemingly geographic and stylistically disparate stories refer to a central connection you can sense but can never articulate and those are the encounters with the things that we can't explain. And they remind us that the world is so much larger than we sometimes remember, uh, that our perspective uh, can always be widened and should always be widened. And that that striving for a higher truth is part of what art is really about. So why do audiences expect this mystery mode, uh, the Agatha Christie mode, even if the piece they are watching is trying to draw them into a dream mode? I think sometimes we are invited to decipher what is put before us in kind of tautological terms, like a closed system, uh, which is heard, you know, which is where what is heard musically affirms what we understand intellectually. And I sometimes feel that this is the residue, the residual effect of 20th century school of symbolism, like Maeterlinck, who I mentioned earlier, where meaning was kind of substituted with one object, and there was this kind of one-to-one -one relationship between a meaning and a uh, and and a particular uh, piece in the world. Um, uh, the connection to Freud is easy to make and the insistence that that wild space of dreams could somehow be deciphered by a dictionary. I know that for me personally, I like keeping track of my dreams and they're often hard for me to articulate or explain, but I've never been more mystified by my own dreams than when I tried to decipher them via a dictionary because I'll have this uh, experience of something. For example, if I have a dream of a horse riding a horse towards the ocean, and I feel very free in this dream, and then I read the dream dictionary and, and read that it's, a, you know, uh, it's an image of anxiety and uh, feeling like you're out of control. So how do I reconcile that? Because my experience of that horse <laughs> is totally different. Um, and I think here I've always sympathized with what the Russian poet Osip Mandelstam said about symbolism when he said, in place of a forest of symbols, we have a taxidermy workshop full of stuffed animals. The rose indicates a young woman, the young woman, the rose, nothing wants to be itself, um, which I always think is really funny. Um, but uh, I bring this up because Mandelstam's invocation of a forest of symbols is an idea that then transformed uh, decades later by semiotic thinkers into a forest of signs. And I think that move from a symbol uh, to a sign is really important. A symbol ultimately suggests a kind of one-to-one -one relationship with a thing, whereas a sign has a kind of life of its own that requires the spectator to decipher it for him or herself. So if Freud says, a horse in your dreams represents uh, an unbridled sexuality that will be your downfall, Jung would say, well, what does the horse mean for you? And I think it's that deciding factor of that independence and interpretive agency of the spectator who approaches what is put before them in an individualistic manner. And the meaning of what they experience can be diff vastly different from person to person. It's what, um, it's what Roland Barthes meant when he said the death of the author is the birth of the reader, that meaning is now assigned to the person who's receiving uh, not the person who's telling. Uh, to put it in a more poetic way, uh, there's a line that I love that goes, it is not the voice that commands the story, it is the ear. And that is a, a line from Italo Calvino's book, Invisible Cities, which was the basis of the opera that I did here with my company, The Industry, which let spectators wander freely through Union Station, hearing live singers and live orchestra uh, all through uh, Union Station um, simultaneously. You would occasionally see the singers, 
Um, or you would spend a good period of time maybe watching the person right next to him and thinking that he or she is singing. Uh, but you assigned the voice to the bodies that were in that space in a way that was kind of uncontrolled from my particular, from, 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 from any of us actually, because it was so open to real life. I think with this, produ uh, this production, I hope you can see the connection to what I discussed earlier about making the uh, immaterial material. I mean, that was a big part of what this production was about, the invisible quality of invisible cities. Uh, the idea of trying to create uh, an opera that didn't have object, an object related to it, um, in which even the voices seem to be divorced from the body. Uh, it's an opera that couldn't be pointed to like a sculpture, but a kind of invisible experience that defied reification. But I was just as much motivated by that hope that the audience could wander through their own forest of signs and supply any number of potential meanings as to what this particular event could mean. In this, I was fundamentally inspired by the Ranciere book, The Emancipated Spectator, who continues the line of thinking by Bart and Calvino and Umberto Eco before him and takes it to another level. Emancipation, he says, begins when we challenge the opposition between viewing and acting. It begins when we understand that viewing is also an action that confirms or transforms this distribution of positions. The spectator also acts like the pupil or scholar. She observes, selects, compares, interprets. She links what she sees to a host of other things that she has seen on other stages in other kinds of place. She composes her own poem with the element of the poem before her. She participates in the performance by refashioning it in her way. They are thus both distant spectators and active interpreters of the spectacle offered to them. Uh, we can talk about that a lot, but I'm going to... I'm going to go to the end of my uh, remarks by coming back to Gottfried, <laughs> to, our, to, to the jolly green giant. Um, because this image sprung from the dream of my visual arts collaborators and had no fixed meaning in advance, I saw this figure as an opening up of the space, uh, actually an opening up of indeterminacy in a theater that has an extreme Teutonic determinacy about it. It was a final opportunity really to confront the irrational aspects of the opera and for the audience to be forced into finding their own meaning just at the moment where everything seemed over and uh, finished. Uh, as a final thought and at the risk of contradicting everything that I just said, I just would like to say that in the, mo in the months since this production opened, I think I finally discovered what this symbol means to me, and that's what I'd like to close with. Um, Elza, as I said, it's, I wanted the story to be about Elza's liberation, um, and it's a, her path towards enlightenment. But as we know, that is a highly disenchanted path in many ways. It's throwing off the shackles of oppressors, but it implies a hardness and a bitterness and a kind of cold grit that kills your romantic notion of the world. This is the path that we see Elsa take as the opera goes on and on. In fact, in the final scene, she only has three lines, and one of them is simply, ach. So uh, she kind of becomes the epitome of this detached, rational observer. But when Gottfried returns, I believe that even if Lohengrin fails, his reappearance is a kind of gift to Elsa, something that she doesn't yet have. And what could that be? I thought, again, in retrospect, afterwards, I realized that what she needed at the end was that sense of wonder, that sense that a miracle can still happen, that something in, in, inexplicable and nonverbal can still happen in this world where everything seems cold and frozen and dead. So the enlightened Elsa and a kind of fantastical Gottfried walking hand in hand away from the contaminated land uh, that's depicted in the opera, it's an image for me that says, the mind, the rational mind, and the imagination, uh, rational and irrational, they belong together and they find a balance in art. In fact, they are, like Elsa and Gottfried, brother and sister. And the final turn for me at the end of the opera was towards allegory. And when I did discover uh, what that meant, um, I think you know most people would think, you probably had that idea from the beginning and then just set about realizing that idea, but that couldn't be further from the truth. I didn't even realize this is what I believe this image meant on the day of the premiere, uh, or even a week after the premiere. I had countless people ask me about Gottfried, but I didn't have a rational, verbal explanation for what Gottfried meant. And it's only after I took a week off and drove, went to the Grand Canyon, uh, just to be alone with my thoughts and process everything I experienced in Bayreuth, 
I was finally able to really decipher this meaning of the, of the brother and sister relationship between the rational and the irrational. And it's not that dissimilar from that experience in dreams. Uh, when an image in a dream haunts you, and much later, as the day starts to close and you think about it more and more, that you start to realize what that image really meant for you personally. And you begin to unlock things in using your rational, the rational side of your brain. And I think that's truly the great joy of all art making, to learn about the world not like a scientist, that is, uh, not from the point of view of setting out a hypothesis and then uh, proving it or disproving it, but rather to experience the world like a shaman who experiences first and explains later, letting the nonverbal live in that tension until the experience has evaporated when our rational abilities start to do the work of synthesizing all of those impressions back into the fabric of our lives. I think that's the great secret of working creatively and I think hopefully also appreciating creative work and that is that the meaning comes afterwards. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Well worth battling the traffic to get here in uh, Westwood. Thank you very much. Um, it's now my pleasure to invite um, both Yuval Sharon and music critter, crit critic for the New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> music critic for the New, York New Yorker, Alex Ross, onto the stage. Um, please let me welcome both of you. Alex was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2008 as well, so now we have two geniuses <laughs> joining us tonight. <laughs> Alex writes about classical music, covering the field from the Metropolitan Opera to the downtown avant-garde. He has also contributed essays on pop music, literature, 20th century history, and gay life. His first book, The Rest is Noise, Listening to to the 20th Century, a cultural history of music since 1900, won a National Book Critics Circle Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He is now at work on his third book, Wagnerism, which explores the composer's vast cultural impact. So we will continue our evening in conversation between these two wonderful guests. Please join me in welcoming them both to the stage. Well, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And it's uh, wonderful to be here with uh, Yuval, whose work I've admired uh, for a number of years. Um, and I first uh, spoke to you in person at length uh, on the occasion of uh, Hopscotch mm -hmm. uh, here in Los Angeles, which I'm sure some people here uh, saw, which was really one of the, the great experiences uh, I've had as a as a spectator and also as uh, as a writer, as a journalist, chronicling the process. I was watching the uh, project come together in its uh, final stages and then wrote a, a long piece for The New Yorker. Um, and, um, and then I was at uh, Bayreuth uh, this summer. I saw uh, not the opening night, uh, <laughs> but uh, the second uh, performance of uh, Lohengrin. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was a it was a fantastic uh, lecture, and, and it made me think about um, a whole bunch of things. And I made semi legible notes <laughs> as I was listening. Uh, but I think the first thing that really struck me was <clears throat> how you step out of uh, this duality, which which so often comes up with opera, which mm. is the duality of of text mm. and music, of of mm. word and tone, and that's that's something that has been. Uh, it was a, a tension that, that existed at the very beginning. Yeah. It was almost as if opera was invented to have that argument right. <laughs> about you know, which comes first, the, the, the music or the text. Right. And Salieri wrote an opera on that subject, and Richard Strauss wrote an object on that subject, and countless thousands of um, right. papers and books have been written about it. But you, you're sort of stepping outside of that and looking at uh, a third term, uh, or, or maybe several other mm. terms, which is the nonverbal, mm. uh, the image, um, the, uh, the, the impression, uh, mm. sort of things, that, the, the images and ideas that, that come to us mm -hmm. uh, as we watch. Uh, was that something, an aspect of opera that, that sort of intrigued you right from the beginning, this, this other dimension? 
Well, the, the nonverbal dimension took me a while to get into because uh, my first experiences with opera, and maybe there's other people in the room that have had a similar experience, was of not really understanding what it is that I'm seeing. I actually think a lot about the character of Parsifal uh, in Wagner's opera, where at the end of Act One, he watches this ritual, and then uh, they say, oh, you don't, under you don't understand anything that you just saw? Uh, you must be a fool. Get out of here. Well, that's exactly how I felt, and I think a lot of people feel when they see opera for the first time, because uh, you, this thing happens, and it all seems so inevitable, and, uh, uh, and so perfectly thought out exactly the way it is, but you don't have necessarily the access to it somehow. It's in a, you know, the very first time, if you, if you haven't been prepared for it, um, it's this music that's flowing in another language uh, that is being spoken. Sometimes, I mean, I was really far away, so you know, all the characters were teeny tiny, and I was 13 years old. So all of these things I thought were so strange. Um, and it was actually, it was lucky, luckily my dad kept bringing me to the opera, <laughs> so I didn't give up on it uh, right away. Um, but I, I think that the more that I went to opera, and the more I started realizing that um, it's not just a concert with costumes, you know, uh, which is how I originally felt uh, my first experiences of opera were all like that, the more I started realizing that there is this um, really uh, unstable relationship between all of the different art forms that are, um, that are actually vying, in a way, for, for prominence mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, for the, the, the top spot, you know, between the words and the music, the visual, uh, the orchestra, the singer, that that, that is a it's, a, it's a wonderful kind of melange of <laughs> voices mm -hmm. and uh, that multiplicity of voices. Um, as soon as I realized that, you know, you, that opera might be closer to poetry than it is to theater, actually, uh, because of its uh, ability to be so associative and actually so wild and, and so different from anything that, that happens. Um, theater will always, you know, will always, I think, be the human being on the stage, you know, um, whereas opera feels like it does take over and sort of immerse uh, the audience in something, even if it remains uh, behind a proscenium arc. There is always something immersive about that quality of the of these merging of the arts. Mm -hmm. I think once I finally understood that, uh, or saw the potential of opera to, to be that, that's when I think I realized that opera doesn't have to be an old art form. Uh, it doesn't have to be looked at as an old art form. It can really be considered an emerging art form, and one mm -hmm. that we're still discovering. Was there a production that you saw early on, or a video that, that sort of crystallized that sense of the, the possibility of stepping beyond the, the, the traditional? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a video. Actually, it was a it was a laser disc at the time when I was at it, <laughs> and I watched the. It was when I watched the whole ring cycle, uh, the Patricia Rowe ring cycle on laser disc in the music library at UC Berkeley, where I just every thirty minutes had to flip over the huge laser disc. You know? <laughs> um, but that experience was. I mean, having the thirty minute that that forced break was kind of good. But um, uh, but that did lead me to realize. Uh, the Wagnerian idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, that total work of art, that to me felt really contemporary still. And that felt like something, and when I, look at, when I look at the contemporary art landscape, I see a lot of artists wanting to work in that mode, towards collaboration, towards trying to ex expand their own, the, the horizon of their own medium and their own practice in different ways. And I see that, and I felt that right away with, with, uh, with uh, Chiro, because also it was not a one-to-one -one relationship of what was supposed to happen in the opera uh, and what's on stage, but there was that 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 the contrast between an image of the um, you know the Rhine maidens being in this kind of power station. I, you know, that's the very first image of that entire cycle, and you know immediately you go, okay, uh, <laughs> that that dissonance in a way that seemingly that seeming dissonance between what you see, what your eye sees, and what your mm -hmm. ear hears, uh, suddenly offered up so many possibilities. Right, and then that got exciting to me. Yeah, and they're just they're they're moments all through that. I don't know how many people have seen the uh, the whole cycle, but it's uh, it's an astonishing achievement, and um, it had its premiere in Bayreuth in 1976, and it was the hundredth anniversary of the festival, uh, and it was this um, extraordinary decision on the part of Wolfgang Wagner, um, uh, the the last surviving grandson. Um, uh, to open up the theater to to uh, a completely different uh, viewpoint, uh, mm -hmm. and, and there had already been this revolution in, in Bayreuth of the 1950s, where Wieland Wagner, Wolfgang's brother, had gotten rid of a lot of the traditional mm -hmm. 
appurtenances mm. and, and bric-a-brac uh, and, and had simplified the stage image right. drastically. It was right. almost as if he was moving toward that, that invisible theater yeah. idea, just, rem just removing, taking away so much from the stage. Totally. Uh, whereas yeah. Chereau, uh was not at all a minimal <laughs> production. And, and there's you know, one track of it which is, which is pushing the story into the 19th century and the 20th century mm. in a political mm. reading. You see the gods as, as the upper bourgeoisie and, and the, the Nibelung dwarfs yeah. as the... Uh, as the, the um, uh, the, the, the industrialists, sort of right. robber barons, kind of <laughs> capitalists. Um, so all those happening. But then, I mean, what I what I love most about that are these these images mm. that come in from some other mm. sphere, like the uh, mm. the pendulum uh, yeah. in Act Two of Wagner, and there's just this this pendulum uh, swinging back and forth, and that is yeah. that is a symbol mm. that 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 cries out for. You know what? What does it mean? Yeah, you know that yeah. that question that you are complaining about, um, and and yet it's just this very very I find very mystic. I don't want to know. I never yeah. ask what that is. This, yeah. this mystical, powerful uh, image uh, that has its own rhythm, yeah. uh, sort of separate from the musical rhythm. So so just throwing these 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 dream images yeah. uh, into the into the mix is um, is very powerful. And those, those as a as a spectator. Mm. That's often what stays with me most is this this kind of gesture mm. or image that, that, that doesn't come yeah. directly from music, exactly. directly from the libretto, but 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 somehow is is consonant with right. the, sort of the ideas yeah. behind it. I, um, I agree. <laughs> and I think that there's often this expectation that a stage director is meant to um, so is meant to basically deliver an essay on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of what I was refer, referring to of looking at the world like a scientist, where this is a hypothesis. And now we're going to show how everything unfolds in a very orderly and rational manner um, to get to our conclusion. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I, I also like you. I, I, I love when things go off track. <laughs> like the science experiment gone horribly wrong. That's what I think would be a better mode of a production. <laughs> you know, where it's right. like we think we're going in this direction, and then all of a sudden things shift. Um, I even think with Wagner too. You know, they're they're so and. I did this with the with the John Adams opera Doctor Atomic too. That there's these two acts that have wildly different musical expressions from one to the other, and it seemed hard for me to try and imagine one uh, visual realization that would work for both. So I kind of went more in the direction of saying, well, Act One is going to be like this, and Act Two is going to be like this. Mm -hmm. And the two, when you looked at pictures, they don't look like the same production at all. But that's kind of my experience of the music. Um, I think. Lohengrin had less of that because the blue and white was such a consistent, I mean, it did have such a kind of uh, teleological color dramaturgy but with the blue and white and orange and, uh, and green at the end. But, um, but still, there are aspects of the Lohengrin that I think there are sudden veering off of things or suddenly some unexpected ideas that don't necessarily have uh, an echo later, that they just were what they were right. and disappeared. And I think that there's something about that that... Um, allows the work to stay open. Yeah. yeah. And I think all the Wagner works have those moments yeah. where, or, or really much more than moments, um, entire aspects of the works which, which, which don't fit into everyone's idea of Wagner as, right. as an artist with, with a very strong, uh, uh, controlling uh, right. idea <laughs> of, of what the opera is about. And in fact, right. if you subject yourself to Wagner's collective writings, uh, you realize soon enough that he had no fixed idea. He was constantly yeah. changing his mind uh, and, and, and uh, would just very often say the precise opposite of what he had said 10 years earlier. Exactly. And, um, exactly. but, you know, but the works themselves have these, have these elements that seem almost deliberately uh, irrational. Yeah, um, and contradictory. Yeah, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and abrupt. I, right. I was thinking as you were talking about this this abrupt appearance of, of Gottfried, a character who we really know nothing about, and he has no particular music attached yeah. to him. There's no, he just appears and disappears, and, and it's bewildering. And, and often there is, there's something that happens right at the end of a Wagner mm -hmm. opera, right. which doesn't quite compute. Right. Uh, it's uh, Kundry falling right. dead at right. the end of Parsifal is something that everyone always has to struggle with, and right. uh, this, this, the sudden appearance of this 
theme at the end of the ring, this mm. gorgeous theme that we'd only heard once before mm. and, yeah. uh, in, in the doctor. So yes, yeah, so this as if we don't have enough to deal with <laughs> <laughs> already uh, in the right. final minutes of, of the right. opera, sort of Wagner throws something new right. at us. But, right. but that can be sort of be the fulfillment of all of these extraneous and kind of contradictory energies that have been totally. sort of playing all along. Yeah, I absolutely <clears throat> think so. I think that's part of the, I think that's part of what is so fascinating uh, by him and why I, you know, that's what I also lo look for with, with, with new opera too. And I think new opera is really, the, the new opera that I've been the most excited about has been the one that seems to, seems to take you down one path and before you know it, you've, uh, you know, you've gone somewhere totally different. Uh, by the beginning and the end of it almost feel like two different pieces. This idea of like creating um, the well-made piece, like in theater, uh, you'll hear a lot of people saying, oh, it's the well-made play that's in, well, I don't know, five acts? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it depends who you're asking, but, uh, right. but you know, like, okay, or in four acts, it's going to have this kind of rising action and falling action. So we always know where we are in this piece. It's kind of like being able to follow uh, a thread and taking the audience very clearly on this journey from beginning to end. And, um, and I don't think, I don't think um, from a director's point of view, I do think it's my responsibility to the audience to to lead them on a journey, but I, um, in my ideal situation, I start them on a journey, and then I like to let them go off, you know, <laughs> and as soon as possible, let them go off in as many different directions as possible, because um, and then you know it's a. Uh, uh, I think everyone needs a good place to start and understand what they are reacting, what they are relating to, and from there it should be about the stuff that Ranciere said, the stuff that mm -hmm. Berta Echo talks about a lot, which is trying to understand what you're seeing in front of you in relation to your own experience as a human being. Yeah. Uh, with your own, uh, how your own nationality, how your own, uh, you know, your own sexuality, how all of that uh, can actually change the meaning of what it is that you're saying. It's not like of what you're seeing. It's not like something put in front of you has a puzzle piece that's missing, and all you have to do is find that one puzzle piece. It's like, no, it's, right. it's okay to create your own puzzle. It's not an educational experience. It's yes. not a lesson that's being imparted. Right. Right. You know, it's something when you talked about the dictatorship of meaning, which is a great phrase, and this this murder mystery model of of theatrical presentation and also of approaching our work mm -hmm. to the point of view of the spectator, it, it occurred to me that um, there there are a couple different modes in in opera that that can take, and the most obvious one is the extremely traditional production mm -hmm. that follows all of the stage directions and and sort of locks itself as much as possible into what the libretto gives you and what the, what the score gives you. Right. But then, you know, I, I think about 20th century mm -hmm. opera productions, which were revolutionary and overturned uh, all of those traditional ideas and exploded in so many different directions. And yeah. just the sheer bewildering variety of, of things that have been put on stage with Wagner's music is mm -hmm. just you know absolutely <laughs> mind-boggling. You know, any century you can think of, any any geographical setting, right. uh, outer space, you know, whatever <laughs> it is, uh, the future, right. yeah. uh, it's it's all been done. But um, it's not necessarily a total liberation uh, because mm. it can very easily turn mm. into a, a didactic yeah. exercise. Well, we're yeah. we're taking this opera that you used to think meant X, <laughs> exactly. and it turns out it's about. Why? Yeah. Um, and so you can just be locked in again so true. to another. So I guess you're yeah. you're sort of stepping back, and that's something that's become very much a tradition at Bayreuth, of course, mm. in yes, recent definitely. decades. These yeah. productions that arrive with you know 100 pages of commentary and and preliminary lectures, <laughs> right. and right. and uh, and so you you find that maybe somewhat imprisoning as, as well. I do, yeah. I think it's the same problem, but just with a different outfit. You right. know, it's like, okay, um, if you are also forced to just also be contrarian the whole time, then then you, you've also lost the connection between the nonverbal and the and the work. You know, it's like, it's mm -hmm. actually, it's, it's really tricky, but you just need to find that balance between what the work inspires and what the work needs to actually communicate on its terms. Right. And what also keeps it new and contemporary and, and shines a new light on it. And that's something that I feel like with, with my collaborators in Bayreuth, I feel like we, we really achieved, which was something that actually, like, in many ways, uh, 
we, we didn't have 100 pages of, <laughs> you know, I think my program note was four pages, um, which might be shocking after how much I talked today that, uh, that my program <laughs> note was so short. But, um, but it was because I wanted to ultimately give that, um, give, give the, 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 the real ideas, the, the, the possibility of inflection to the audience instead of, instead of to me. But it was all through a process of really uh, meditating on what is really there, how would it resonate, and what signs could I introduce into this that could problematize it sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but allow us to have a relationship that's, again, I think the word for me that I always go back to is destabilizing, mm -hmm. you know? But destabilizing doesn't mean uh, disrupting, <laughs> as a, a word that has been following me lately. But, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> but the idea, instead, that we are going back and forth between our mode of understanding the work as it is, and then all of a sudden having this new appreciation of it and then maybe going back to something that is a, let's say, for example, the hair from Melisande. I, I don't know how you would do a right. production of that without the hair, you know? Right. Uh, like, you need to figure out the hair. You need to do something with the hair. And um, I think if you don't do it, that's also uh, a common tactic is to say, well, we're not going to do anything with the hair. It's going to just be in the audience's imagination. That can sometimes be really powerful in the right context. And sometimes it's a little bit of a cop-out of what we really do have to uh, grapple with that we right. have to really look at the work that's there and find out a way to, to realize it. Yeah, so not to get away from this idea of revisionism, because if you, if you revise a text, right. You've, right. you've changed a bunch of things, but it's, it's still a fixed text in, yeah. in the end, and you've just sort of added your language to it, whereas you're seeking right. something which is uh, finding the, mm. the sort of instabilities and the dissonances, yeah. and, the, and also the sort of the unsuspected maybe yeah. Affirmations. It doesn't need to be always <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> negative and, yeah. and uh, about just sort of you know, taking down what, what exists. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and a Bayreuth, maybe you ran up against the expectation that everything that there there would be a sort of fixed text and that there, right. there needs to be a kind of yes and no. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes and no. I think what I what I. What I ran up against most was probably this feeling that, okay, well, this is going to be, you know, the, the Lohengrin that we replaced uh, was, most, was most notorious for having the entire chorus in, in rat costumes. And, um, and that the, the chorus was this ensemble. It was like a laboratory experiment. And uh, it's a really brilliant idea. Um, the director was Hans Neuenfels. And so this is the one that, that followed it. Okay, and that one was really stark. It was black and white. It was rats, you know what I mean? It was, it was very German, let's just put it that way. Uh, you know, it had a long program, I mean a huge program. Um, you know, really, really, in, in many ways, um, and I didn't see it live, so I don't know if I can really comment on how effective I think the production was. I will just say that it, it works on a really rational level, uh, in a way, when you think about it, um, and appeals to that rational side. Of, of your mind, which is it is kind of like an argument. Um, it has a fantastical element too, but but it, uh, it, it appeals to the intellectual side, um, almost at the expense of sometimes just the aesthetic side of it. Um, um, and, and one could argue. Uh, <laughs> and I think what I think the reason that people go to opera, or the the thing that opera can do that no other art form really can, is appeal to everything all at once: is your brain, your heart, your soul your body, and that's why I love with the industry projects actually getting the audience to move around and to be in their body uh, while they're experiencing something is to not forget that you're still, you still have a, uh, a shell <laughs> that your spirit is in, that you haven't left it entirely, but, uh, but uh, you're still in, uh, still with yourself somehow. Um, I think that that holistic idea is something that, that I don't know too many other art forms that can, that have that possibility to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, and film, I love film, but the, the two-dimensionality of it, you know, will always mean that you're somewhat of a distant right. spectator, I think, you know, whereas this, and also that three-dimensionality of sound, I think, uh, gives it uh, a real power. Yeah. And the question of the proscenium at Bayreuth is, is a very interesting one, and, and it's, um, it's been said many times to have been uh, a premonition or sort of anticipation of the cinema. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, I think Friedrich Kittler, the theorist, uh, uh, described it as the, the birth of cinema or something like that, um, for the reason that uh, it's 
partly has to do with the, the, the blacking out uh, mm -hmm. of the theater. So traditionally, at Bayreuth, the lights completely go off. Right. You're plunged into darkness, and then the, the stage uh, uh, is lit up. Right. Um, and then you have this, this double uh, mm -hmm. proscenium. So it's this very strong frame that's supposed to you know, absolutely direct your, your vision uh, right. uh, you know, away from the crowd, away from the sort of surrounding space, you know, you know, onto the stage. Yeah. And then the orchestra disappears right. and becomes a soundtrack, yeah. uh, in, in a sense, yeah. uh, as, as, in the, as in the cinema. And, and on the one hand, that's, that's quite amazing that the, the sort of Wagner played that yeah. role in, in, in really sort of developing the experience of the cinema before it existed. Yeah. But yeah, there, there's also, uh, there's a, f a fixedness to that kind yeah. of experience which takes away some of what we love about mm -hmm. theater. Uh, yeah. The spontaneity, the totally. messiness, the, 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 the improvisatory yeah. the kind of uh, exactly. you know, ability of the performers to, to add their own voices. So that's, that's something quite interesting to think about in terms of the uh, <laughs> it is. ambiguous, yeah. as always, sort of the ambiguous influence of yeah. Wagner's uh, incredible mind. Absolutely, um, yeah. No, it's funny coming away from there going, well, I see the, I see the limitations of this. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's not as freeing somehow as you'd imagine when you say it. The orchestra, it, it's all the world of the stage. You know, it sounds like it's this, this real ideal. But as I mentioned before, like, you know, the, the stage should carry, a lot. obviously should carry a a lot of what the experience of an opera is, but um, but I personally am, have been thinking how ever since uh, ever since the production, yeah. What about everything else? <laughs> you know, um, you know Brecht's famous critique of Wagner was that uh, because he hid the orchestra, he made the the production of those sounds uh, just like magic in a way to kind of uh, convince the audience that they're they're hallucinating or you know they're dreaming, and it, he called it kind of a the Gesamtkunstwerk a kind of witch's brew. In which you don't see how anything's made. I mean, he was, mm -hmm. you know, obviously very uh, Marxist uh, in his thinking, and that the production, the mode of production, should always be visible somehow. Right. Um, and so Bayreuth and Wagner for him was such an uh, uh, antithetical idea that you cover and you you make the the mode of production invisible. It's uh, in a way for him a kind of um, reiteration of. Uh, of these kind of capitalist powers, right. you know, and Adorno um, also made this critique that the, the Wagner, it's it's this this seamlessly mm, produced right. uh, product where all the all the labor disappears, yeah, and exactly. you're in this dream world, this right. phantasmagoria, of, of, you know, right. which I think is not what Wagner is about at all for me. Yeah, I just I do either. feel all these, I, I, and I don't think the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk was that yeah. that the the the, the text and music and, and actors and singers would, would dissolve and lose right. their identities yeah. and, and become this single right. total object. I don't <laughs> think that was, you know, that was ever his idea. No, um, I don't how think much, so. Uh, five minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> on over, right. <laughs> keep everyone <laughs> captive. So can you, so you've done these, these amazing productions that just completely explode the, there is no stage. There, there is no theater. Uh, and uh, hopscotch mm. um, uh, took place in, in really many locations uh, around the city. Uh, invisible cities, which unfortunately I did not get to see live, turned uh, Union Station into mm. um, into its theater. Uh, have you thought about stagings of more traditional operas in such settings, or or does it have to be new music, a work? specifically mm -hmm. composed for this type of drastically different yeah. occasion? It's a really good question, and I think that I'm, I'm, I contemplate that question a lot. I will say that when, um, for a piece like Hopscotch that took place in the 24 cars moving all through the city, or War of the Worlds, which is at Disney Concert Hall and at three other sirens outside Disney Concert Hall simultaneously, you know, um, to write a piece in which the, that, uh, that form actually became part of the content, you know, in each of those in each of those pieces, you know, that, that that idea of the communication from a siren to Disney Concert Hall was then how we got to uh, War of the Worlds. It's kind of that idea that you know, really, the meaning does come afterwards. It's like we come up, we start with an idea, and we let it roll, and we, we explore what that means, and then we're ready to say, well, this is what we're doing. Um, that's much harder with uh, a finished work in some way. And I, I can't help but feel that, you know, if we were, if the industry were a company that did 
an opera in Cars, but it was Carmen in Cars. <laughs> <laughs> Carman. Uh, you know, I don't know. You know, um, it was. You know, I, I think um, I, I, there are companies that are really attempting to do that, and um, they seem to be successful because audiences are surprised, and you know, surprise is always an amazing. Uh, characteristic uh, to awaken in anybody. And so I think that's not a bad thing. But does it touch the soul of the work to put it in uh, moving cars? I, I don't know. I don't think so at all. <laughs> you know, or um, I had someone say, OK, well, I'd like to do something like hopscotch here in our city, but I want it to be La Boheme. And I said, well, you know, I, that doesn't make any sense. You know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, why don't you just do La Boheme, you know, and then do a new piece with this mode in mind. You know? um, also, because there are so many amazing composers that need these opportunities, you know, that we can't just keep doing the old repertoire over and over again. You know, it's amazing to go to, to, Bayreuth, to, to do Wagner there. I mean, that's, that's incredible, but um, it wouldn't mean anything to me if I wasn't also de so devoted to contemporary music because, you know, we, just the way that everything else is this balance, you know, between material, immaterial, uh, all, of the, all of these things, it's all about finding a balance between all these things. And I think the most important balance for opera is the new and the repertoire that I think you can't go in only one direction because as soon as you do, the other, the, the art form loses its oxygen. I mean, I can't imagine an art form that you would consider a living art form if it wasn't producing new work. Mm -hmm. You know, it would instantly be a museum because you'd only ever do Marriage of Figaro, Carmen, you know, <laughs> they're great pieces <laughs> and they deserve to be done again. And my experience of, you know, um, uh, recently on a, on a trip I saw uh, um, the Britain Gloriana, which is such a weird, totally bizarre piece, and the next night was uh, Purcell, the Fairy Queen. And I heard Purcell with such new ears after hearing Britain. And that relational idea from an older piece to contemporary pieces, that's the, the, the older pieces need it. <laughs> you know, the, the classic works need that breath of fresh air and that ability to hear it with new with new ears that the new provides. And if the new, on the, to look at it from the other side, if the new didn't have that anchor and that tradition of all of these brilliant, amazing minds that have explored that relationship between words and music or between theater and concert, um, I mean, that's, no one's inventing this stuff. We're just kind of finding new ways of, of, of putting them together. And so the, the new needs the classic as well. Right. And so I think it's all about finding that, that relationship. Yeah, and you can't let, yeah, I mean, it's to talk, I mean, you've talked about disrupting, is that awful word? Uh, um, <laughs> uh, sort of interrogating and, and kind of teasing out uh, mm. sort of different energies and ideas from traditional works, but at the same time, you, mm. you remain very devoted to the work itself yeah, and definitely. paying close attention to it, and, and you don't want to just completely rip it right. away from its natural habitat, in a sense. And there is, I mean, there's this trend toward Everything being done in alternative spaces and, and La Boheme and the auto <laughs> junkyard and, and so on and, right. and and but it, the problem is when it becomes when the thrill of it mm. uh, becomes uh, just the logistics yeah, in a sense exactly. and the and the and the just uh, it could be anything in this exactly. auto junkyard and exactly. and so yeah. it, it, there needs to be that organic yeah. relationship which you right. had in Hopscotch because mm. everything was completely integrated the, exactly. the composers. Uh, were responding to, you know, not just to the idea of the work itself, but to the specific yeah. sites. And Veronica, <laughs> the were, yes. Veronica <laughs> Casas kept rewriting her piece, right. basically from night to you know day to day, right. with the uh, right. responding to the uh, the the um, acoustics of the yeah. uh, my mind is by, the Bradbury building, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so that kind of just yeah the, that that total yeah. you know so that. There was this incredible thrill of being in these spaces and just behaving in a way that you, know, yeah. you never have as a spectator, but, but it was also the works were, were totally wrapped up in the specifics of, Absolutely. of, of where you were. Absolutely. I mean, for me, and it's, it's tough with the, the projects for the industry because they are so uh, outlandish in, in, conceptual, in, in its conceptual phase that... Um, and it's often that which excites people and gets them in the door, you know? Uh, so thinking about it with a marketing perspective, it's like, okay, what's gonna excite people uh, to actually buy the ticket? It's like, okay, here's something you have never quite experienced before. But if that was the end of the experience, that would, that would not be an opera, you know? That would be an Instagram uh, experience, right. you know? That would be yeah. something that's like, 
okay, cool. Yeah, nice. You know, I was there. Yeah. yeah, I was there. I took my selfie, and it's all good. Uh, yeah. You know, everyone's yeah. liked it, so everyone saw that I that I that I do cultured things. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, that would be like that would be where that that experience ends. But as soon as that um, that outer form actually connects with the ideas that people are that that the whole team uh, the the entire collaboration is trying to articulate and looking for ways to articulate. Um, then it's a real artistic experience, I think, and that's right. always been what we've what we've strived to achieve. Yeah. Just to close, to go back to the little the little green man. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you're going back to Bayreuth yes. uh, next summer, and this is the tradition of Bayreuth is is the first year is really almost preliminary, and directors yes. come back and often make very extensive changes. Yeah. So your review that you may have written, <laughs> in my case of the you know first production has nothing to do with what people are seeing three years later. <laughs> right. um, so how, will you be revisiting that particular moment in, in the work? Did you like it exactly the way it is? Do, I, can, you, is can you prepare it in some slightly different way that yeah. would meet people's <laughs> whatever that was. <laughs> I think that that's also a balance because um, the fact that people didn't get it or didn't you mm -hmm. know didn't respond to it right doesn't mean you give up on it. Right. You know, um, actually, part of me wants to say, well, now he's going to be in the whole opera. <laughs> 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 now he's going to be there the entire time uh, and actually leave when he's supposed to come. No, I wouldn't do that either. But um, but to get rid of it would also imply that oh yeah that. Uh, all of all the questions that it that it kicked up in the in the in the spectator, those were the wrong questions. And I actually think the questions were right, mm -hmm. and the bewilderment is was right actually. Um, um, so I want to keep it, but I think we're going to actually make it a smaller costume. Um, so, so yes, I will change something about it. But like, and that's but it makes a huge difference actually. From there were people here that were at the dress rehearsal, and there were some people that were that were there opening night that I know were there, like Barry Nancy. Um, uh, you know, there was um, uh, in the in the the dress rehearsal. He came the way that you saw it in the picture. He he came from all the way at the back, and he basically stared straight out the audience. And um, I think that's what provoked. A, I don't think that's the only reason it provoked a laugh, but somehow you were the way he came on stage was uh, not right. And so trying to think about how to adapt it, I then had him come when you when you saw it, and when people that came to the premiere saw it. He actually came from the side and had this, he went straight upstage, so you didn't see his face, and you actually were then more focused on what he was looking at, which was Elsa. And so it was more about Elsa's reaction to, the, to Gottfried than it was about just Gottfried appearing. And I think that made a huge difference. And I yeah. think that, um, and it's so funny how sometimes it's just those tiny, it seems tiny, because it's, you know, it's not related to any stage machinery, it didn't relate, you know. I didn't change the lighting. I didn't change anything. I just actually just said, "Well, enter from stage right instead <laughs> and walk up stage." And that that I think at, sold the moment a lot better than it did for the dress rehearsal. Um, so I was so glad to be able to have snuck that change in right at the end. <laughs> um, and for the so so I keep thinking about those little ways that actually can make the image more successful and feel also to make sure that it also felt as. Uh, Desired as possible from us that it was actually what what you saw was completely what we wanted, right? And and uh, not that moment of is that what they mean? Do I, am I supposed to get that? You know, so the fact that people asked that question make did make me wonder how can I how can I, what can I tighten about it right. um, that can make it even that much more effective or that much more uh, yeah uh, clear. So, and of course, so, the tradition of Bayreuth is that everything that bewildered the audience and the critics and caused consternation uh, at the at the first <laughs> run, by the end of the yeah. run, you're know, several years later, becomes oh, yeah. legendary and, totally. and beloved. Yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> and then the next low end grid, people will say, "Well, there's nothing as wonderful as that <laughs> green man." <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, I miss the green man. I miss the yes. green man. They'll, they'll be selling like little keychains with the green man on it. It's, right. It's all, you, you should know. have seen the green man. That was that, that one. Was yes. So that, yes. <laughs> no one knew what it meant, but it was amazing. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, so well, that's, that's what that's what it's I. So a wonder I'll, of opera. That's yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I'll that's what I'll hope for. But it's it's out of my hands in a way. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This thank was you. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, thank you very much.